Greetings and welcome to our study through the Psalms. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 10, and so you might want to turn in your Bibles and get there. This Psalm here is a Psalm of lament. Whoever is writing it, we don't know if it was David or someone else that doesn't give us the author, uh, but we do know that it's sandwiched in between a lot of the Psalms that David wrote. And it's uh, dealing with some of the same themes that we have seen over the past few weeks. So it could be very well that it was David that uh, wrote this, but we don't know for sure. But it is a psalm of lament. The psalm writer is lamenting over something, and you're going to see that right off the bat, you know, as he begins to question God, uh, he gives a couple of questions in the first verse. But this this whole psalm seems to be a lament over the prosperity of wicked people. And uh, where is the Lord in all of this? And yet by the end, he has the ultimate confidence that God will bring all things to light and bring things to judgment. And we need to remember that today. But let's just start right off, right off the bat here. In verse 1, it says, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? So right off the bat, he's got two questions for God. First of all, I'd like to say, you know, it's okay to come to the Lord and ask these types of questions. He wants uh, a heartfelt prayer and so when you are thinking this way you can't hide it from him anyhow you might as well ask him uh, I believe that he gives us the answer but this psalmist says why do you stand far off sometimes it feels as though God is not involved he's standing at a distance and he's hiding himself especially in times of trouble but we are assured in the word of God that he never leaves us and he never forsakes us. I do know that there are times in the word of God that he says he hides himself. That does not mean he's not present. He's just not making himself known. He's not, he's hiding. I, I always imagine it's like a plain hide and go seek with my grandkids you know, if they're really small and grandpa can find good hiding spots and they can't seem to be able to find me, they may get a little nervous and say, well, where's grandpa? And they might even start to cry. You know, where's grandpa? He's gone. He's gone. I'm alone here. Uh, but I'm there in the room. It's just that I found a good hiding spot. And we see what happens. Uh, when God hides, he's testing our hearts to see uh, what's in our hearts. It's okay to question God. I'm going to start out going to a, a Psalm 77 verses 7 through 9 where there are six more questions and uh, I think they're good to, for us to look at. Will the Lord cast off forever? There's the first question. And will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah, or think about that. So six questions from this psalm writer. Six more questions. Great questions. Maybe you have felt this way. I've got this written down in my Bible. Six questions. In the margin, I wrote the answer to them, no, he hasn't forgotten. And he will be favorable. He's mercy, for, mercy lasts forever. It's new every morning. But we sometimes get to those places in our walk where we're questioning and not sure what's going on. And especially for this psalm writer in Psalm 10, he's lamenting. And I just got to remind you, a righteous, a person that's wicked wouldn't be questioning these things. He wouldn't come to this place, he or she. But this person, it's bothering. It's bothering them. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Lot as Peter tells us about Lot and refers back to, you know, when he was living in Sodom, his righteous soul was vexed every single day. And so sometimes we can get like that. And obviously the psalm writer's like that. He's like, where are you, God? Why are you standing far? Well, why is it that the wicked prosper? And you know what? 
we're going to deal with this. And I think David and other psalm writers bring this to the forefront in many of the psalms because, you know, it's it, it's bothering them. It's around them. It bothers us when we see these kind of things happening. And why is it so much? Why are we are they writing so many things? Well, I just kind of think that uh, bottom line, uh, quick answer, the the road to destruction is wide and many are on that road and so if we're surrounded by that we're going to notice it an awful lot and we're going to come to this place where it begins to bother us again the psalm writer says why do you stand afar off O lord why do you hide in times of trouble verses two through four the wicked in his pride persecutes the poor he, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked bo boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Man, do you see all those things? And we've, we've dealt with this stuff before in previous Psalms. But it says three different times, the wicked, the wicked, the wicked. And wicked people are one are just ungodly. They don't think about God. They don't care about God. Um, <clears throat> they may be atheists and say, "I don't." Uh, God's not in any of my thoughts. They may just not be bothered with God. They don't care about the things of God. And so, uh, this psalm writer gives a description that the, the wicked in their pride, in his pride. And there's boasting and there's a proud countenance, countenance, and they don't seek God and God is in none of their thoughts. There is no fear of God <clears throat> at all and they don't even give him a thought. And as a result, they don't have a love or a respect for their fellow man. God wants us to love him first with all our heart and love our neighbors as ourselves. But, you know, when you don't love God and you don't care about God and his ways, then you're not going to care too much about other people either. And so they devise wicked schemes against, uh, against poor people. And it says here that they bless the greedy and renounce the Lord. I don't want to know you. But they, they look up to people that are greedy and have a lot of things so so that's part of the character it's going to go on verses five through seven his ways are always prospering your judgments are far above out of his sight as for all his enemies enemies he sneers at them he has said in his heart i shall not be moved i shall never be in adversity his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. The things that come from their mouths, you know, are cursing, deceit, oppression. What's in the heart comes out of the mouth. And so if this is in your heart, that's what's going to come out. And it says that here. He has said in his heart, and you can sense the pride, I shall not be moved and I shall never be in adversity. This is the first of three times when you hear the phrase, he has said in his heart. It started in verse 5 saying, his ways are always prospering, your judgments are far above. Again, the prosperity of the wicked, it bothers us to see that, that evil people are doing well and it's just does some sometimes does not seem fair why are you hiding why why do you bless this and the wicked person is saying god's judgments it's not coming it's out of his sight and uh at, at any rate he has said in his heart i shall not be moved there's pride there arrogance and I'm not going to be in adversity. Nobody's ever going to get me. This is the first of three times that he says he has said in his heart. And so, therefore, what's in your heart, like I said, will end up coming out of your mouth. And uh, that's what verse 7 says. Cursing, deceit, oppression under his tongue, tongue is trouble and iniquity. Verses 8 through 11 
He sat, sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lie, lies low, <clears throat> that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. So it gives us a description of the wicked person who is scheming and hiding and, you know, looking at others to see and seeing how he can cause them to fall or, you know, innocent people. He, he goes after the innocent. Wicked people, um, they're going after the innocent people. He's like a lion that lies by the den and just waiting, just waiting to catch, catch his prey. And uh, just kind of reminds me that the Lord tells us in the New Testament, I think it's Peter that tells us this to um, resist the devil. Be aware that he's a roaring lion, lion and he's seeking whom he may devour. We need to be aware of the wicked schemes of the enemy. But in verse 11, he says, he has said in his heart, there's the second time God has forgotten. They have the sense that God forgets he hides his face, and he will never see. God, he says, God has, has forgotten. He, he doesn't know. And so sometimes we think that, um, you know, because something we did maybe a decade ago or 20 years ago can be forgotten, you forgot it, and so God would forget it. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you have not come to the Lord and asked forgiveness for those sins, he has not forgotten. He keeps good records, and he knows, and he's going to run the records. He is. He's going to roll, roll the tape, and God does not forget. Time does not erase sin from God's memory. It will not. The only time it erases sin from his memory is when you ask forgiveness. Then he says he forgets it. He forget. We don't usually forget it, but he forgets it. He throws it in the deepest blue sea. As far as the east is from the west, he has forgotten. He blots it out. He deletes it. So we have great confidence in that today. But for the wicked person, oh, God does not forget. He also says in this verse, he will never see. Psalm 94 verses 7 through 9 say this, 7 and 9, I'm sorry, just 7 and 9. Yet they say the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? Right there in that psalm, the same thing, the, the, the psalm writer there is people, people are saying, wicked people are saying, the Lord doesn't see, he doesn't understand, he doesn't care. And God says, I'm the one who made the ear. I'm the one who made the eye. I'm going to be able to see and I can hear and I can record everything. And so judgment does come. We must, uh, we must remember that. Verses 12 and 13 in Psalm 10, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. There's a call to action again by the psalmist here. Please, Lord, arise. Do something about this. Lift up your hand. And do not forget those who are humble. You know, again, it reminds me, I believe it's in Luke 18, where God says he will avenge those who cry out to him day and night. He does not forget. And he won't forget the humble. In fact, he dwells with the humble, it says in Isaiah 57. He dwells <clears throat> with the humble and contrite to revive them. But the psalmist calls God to action, and then he asks the question, why do the wicked renounce God? Why? And then it says, the third time he has sent his heart, you will not require an account. Well, we're going to see 
you need to be reminded today that they won't get away with anything. Nobody gets away with anything. And uh, he does bring all things to light and all, thing to account, all things to account. Uh, but let's go on in verses 14 through 18. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Again, this person was, Lord, take action. Please do something. Please do something. You have seen all this trouble. You have seen this. And there will be a reward. There will be a payment. And uh, again here, the helpless, and that's all of us at some time, commits himself to you. You feel helpless today about anything? Well, commit yourself to the Lord. He's the best helper. It says you are the helper of the fatherless. That's the orphan. God has a special place in his heart for orphans and for widows. And so it declares here, you're the one who helps them. So on we go. Uh, verses 16 to 18, the conclusion, uh, here it is again, the psalm writer here <clears throat> comes to the conclusion that uh, God, God will bring judgment in his time and in his way. We must remember too that, uh, you know, he, he was patient with us, long suffering, he still is every day. And that's really what's going on here. He's being patient, giving all a chance to repent. Thank God that you, if you know the Lord is your Savior, thank God that, well, you responded to the call and you received mercy and not judgment. Thank God that he was patient with you. And that's what he's doing now. He's being patient with others. But the conclusion is, is that God will bring about judgment. Verses 16 through 18, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Oppression has been around since the beginning. Men oppress one another, try to make them slaves. Slavery still goes on today, and God sees it. I love these verses that just say the, ner the nations have perished out of the land. You know, it just Psalm 37, which I'm going to look at in just a few seconds here, all throughout that psalm, it is talking about uh, the evil perishing out of the land and the meek inheriting the earth. You hear our prayers, you hear the desire of the humble, and you prepare our heart, and you will cause your ear to hear. So judgment does come. The psalmist comes to that conclusion, and uh, that's a good conclusion to come. He starts out with two questions. Where are you, God? You know, why are you standing far off? By the end of it, he's saying, I know that you're sovereign and you're in control, and uh, we must be patient. Now, again, I want to, even though we've finished Psalm 10, there are some other verses that I, I, I want to bring to your attention. As I mentioned, Psalm 37, verse 1, the whole psalm is great, but verse 1 says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. See, the Lord doesn't want you to be fretful over these. And obviously, the psalm writer in Psalm 10 is beginning to fret. And by the end of it, I don't think he's fretting anymore. And that's the key for us. We don't want our righteous souls vexed every day like lots. I mean, we, we're going to experience that, but we need to get to that place where we're not fretting over it. All the evil that exists, all the bad things that are going on, we can let them pile up. I, my, my advice to you is if you've been watching too much news on the TV, turn it off. Turn it off and go to the Lord. Don't fret because of evil doers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For, uh, iniquity. Further down in Psalm 37, 
In verse 10, it says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Do you see that there? It's just a little while. But Lord, it's, it seems like thousands of years. No, to him, it's just a little while. And in, in light of eternity, it's just a little while. The wicked will be no more. They'll be no more. Oh, man. When he reigns in the millennial reign, things are going to be good. And even past that, for all of eternity, there will be no more wicked. And it says here, you're going to look for him. He's not going to be there. He's not going to be there. Be show, shall be no more. But what does it say? The meek. That doesn't mean weak. That means broken. Meek. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in what? The abundance of peace. Uh, I think this psalm writer is like, oh man. That's what I'm really looking for, the abundance of peace. Well, that's where we're going to live, in a place where there is no war and contention. <clears throat> Two more verses from Isaiah. I'm going to read from Isaiah 13, verses 6, 11, and 13. I'm going to put them together. It says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. I will punish the, earth, the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the, the haughtiness of the terrible. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. There's a day coming and he's going to bring all things, all the counts are going to balance. He's going to take care of it. But, but what did you pick up when I read through those? I will. God will do these things. His promise is true. He is faithful. He does not lie. So if his word declares it, he will bring things to light. He will bring things to judgment. Everything he will. And uh, what are we supposed to do about that? Well, these wicked people need to come around. We were once in that place, and thank God for his patience. So that's what he's waiting for, but he is going to bring to judgment. He, he will do that. But I'll finish with Isaiah 26, verses 20 and 21. It says, Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. God promises to bring judgment and at the same time we can find comfort in verse 20. What does he say to his people? Come, enter into your chambers. I think that well, we can think a lot of things about that. He he going to bring us to his house. We have our own rooms. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself from the indignation, from the anger. We're not destined for wrath. And so we need to take heart in these verses that uh, God says, I'll hide you. Are you righteous? Uh, are you? I'm going to take care of these things. I'm going to bring judgment on the earth but where are you today? Will you be hiding? I pray that you will be hiding in your room. And I personally believe he means we're going to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And uh, I just want to leave you with that thought. Hide yourself in him today. Uh, so with that, I just uh, pray that you have a great day today and that uh, you sense his grace and his mercy, and that you meditate upon his word all the day long. Feel his presence. Amen.